Good morning, everyone. Um, it's actually my pleasure to introduce our speaker. And um, Sierra is just in another meeting to go to as soon as she's finished. There you go. <laughs> that, that gives me a chance to quickly check in with people online that you can hear me. Can I get a wave? Yes. Okay, that's great. So before we start, I would like to acknowledge the traditional elements of the land and past, present, and future of the Gandhi people. Um, and uh, yeah, really, really great to have um, Professor Graham Miller here today. I think it's your first formal visit to the university. I've known Graham for over 20 years. That's how long it has taken for you to come. That's really good to have you. <laughs> and it's the best time of the year to visit. Um, nice and good. Um, and so, so just a few words about um, Graham. Um, so he's a professor at the University of Surrey. The last six years, he's been full vice chancellor of the business school. Um, Big, big business school and um, managed our tour, sort of fit in a few other tours and things, even though this business school is, is much wider. Um, the past editor of the Journal of Sustainable Tourism, um, chief judge of the World Travel and Tourism Council, uh, Tourism for Tomorrow Awards. Um, and I had the pleasure of uh, sometimes being a judge, and maybe you draw on it today because those awards really give interesting insights into good practice and innovative approaches that uh, businesses and destinations go around the world. Um, Graham is still involved in the environment in a whole lot of other things, which I try to remember, chair of the Civil Reporter years, and you name it. Anyway, it's really good to have you here. Um, looking forward to um, whether competition will help us with sustainability. It's sort of, you, sort of a challenging title. Um, because these things intuitively maybe don't work together, but um, I, I give it to Graham. Um, Graham must sit because we have optimized the camera, and apparently he's got the habit to walk out back and forth when that won't work. So, very informal. Um, I leave it to you when you're ready to um, start, and then we just have questions um, afterwards, I suggest. Excellent. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you, everybody, for, for coming. It's, um, it's always nice. I saw the list of uh, attendees, Chantal, that uh, sent that to me. Very funny. Uh, and I was really pleased. <laughs> really pleased. With it's like, of course, it's all for the lunch. I understand that it's for the lunch that people are coming. Um, but I'm really pleased to be here. As uh, Susanna says, it's taken a long time of trying to organise diaries. Um, I, um, yeah, I'm going to sit largely because I've just got my temperature back under some sort of control again. And if I expend any energy, I might start breaking out uh, in sweating, uh, which is not a good look. So I'm going to sit. I am conscious that two days ago we gave lots of feedback to the PhD students on how to uh, present. And so I'm an absolute sitting target, <laughs> not, not, doing my, exactly, not doing what I, uh, I suggested that you should do as well. So. I'm very conscious of the, the peril I'm in here. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk for, for a little bit and ask questions. The first time I've given this presentation, um, as Susanna said, for the last six years, I've been Pro Vice Chancellor at the University of Surrey in the UK. Um, I was Executive Dean of Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. So I have 10 schools that looked after business school, hospitality, and tourism, but law, politics, economics. Uh, so I had about 600 staff that worked in my faculty. Um, we about a 250 million Aussie dollar budget um, and about 7,000 students. I also looked after a campus in China um, <clears throat> where we had about 2,000 students. I was Pro Vice Chancellor for Employability for the university. Uh, and we were the last year the number one ranked university for employability in the UK. Um, and I was also responsible for sustainability at the university. Um, and we did very well and we had some successes uh, in that. But so I did those roles for six years, and I share that with you, not out of uh, out of arrogance or anything at all, but because actually that's what fuels a lot of this presentation. It's my experience of the last six years there. I was five and a half years as head of school for that before. So I've had 11 years of senior management at the university. So it's really the reflection on that that, 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 that this presentation comes from. So that's what I wanted to talk about. And um, the university, we had about 2,000 staff. Um, so I sat on the executive board of the university, 13 members of the executive board. Uh, really most people at the university have the good sense to want to go nowhere near the executive board of the university whatsoever. So I'm not saying in any way that 2,000 people wanted to be on the executive board, but 
when we did the personality tests and all those kind of awful things that you do as a, as a senior team, competitiveness was one of the themes that came out really strongly that we all shared in common. And the executive board, I found at times a very unpleasant place to be uh, and certainly a very competitive place to be. Um, and I think a lot of that was by virtue of the fact with the last 13 people out of an organization of 2000 that have sort of trodden over bodies to get to the last sort of, uh, the last group of people. So that's, so this is that comes from, from that sort of um, reflections uh, on that. We did have some, some successes as sustainability. Um, so I got a, uh, a commitment to be net zero uh, for the university by 2030. We've got a second university after Cambridge to do, uh, to get that, that level of commitment. I've got reflections now on whether that was a good thing or not. And we've got that. We also got a 12 megawatt solar farm agreed um, at the university. It'll be the largest in UK universities. Um, and that's about a 20 million pounds, so 20 million dollar, uh, so 40 million uh, Aussie dollar project that will provide us with about 30% of our renewable energy uh, for the future. So we had some real successes. Against that, though, I didn't get a divestment policy for the university. I couldn't get us to agree to divest from fossil fuels for our investments. Um, I failed to get a strong procurement ethical procurement policy uh, into the university. I couldn't change our banking policy. Uh, I wanted us to invest in an ethical, put our money in an ethical bank rather than um, we were with Barclays, um, who invest in fossil fuels, so I couldn't get that changed. Couldn't get a business travel policy through that had any real sort of teeth to it. Um, I got near death threats for trying to introduce a meat-free Monday uh, on campus. That was uh, lots of scars. Uh, from trying that. Um, and then for us to try to take a more active policy, so public stance on things like the Uyghurs, um, the invasion of Ukraine, and just being a more uh, forwardly ethical or forwardly moral university rather than one that is very sort of reactive only if you have to be uh, in a moral situation. So the, some successes, but inevitably it's the kind of failures that's, um, that's sticking it in. Um, so change that over. Yes. <clears throat> so I um, started with thinking when I wanted to try to, what does this all mean? Uh, and am I still an academic that's able to, to do any useful thinking? So started with the responsible leadership literature. It seemed like those were the two phrases of what I was trying to do, responsible and leadership. Um, you go back to the classics of the Milton Friedman, for those of you who know a little bit about the literature of Milton Friedman, the social responsibility of businesses to make profits. That's the, the Milton Friedman won a Nobel Prize, I haven't. Um, so he's uh, at least got some claim to have some ground there. Um, contrast that then with the, uh, the Freeman, I'm helpful that the names are so similar, but the Freeman perspective of the stakeholder approach to business, which is that the aim of business is really a uh, an aggregation or a collection or at least an acknowledgement of a broader set of stakeholders um, objectives and these have got redefined and as academics we like to come up with our own phrases for things that are essentially the same but strategists are so the people who are trying to use corporate uh, social responsibility in a way to make profit so we pursue CSR because it's a profitable thing to do rather than because we believe it's the right thing to do Whereas an integrator would be somebody that really is trying to achieve the goals, stakeholder um, kind of perspective. So the responsible leadership um, literature, um, uh, responsible leadership is defined as, as an orientation or a mindset uh, taken by people in executive level positions towards meeting the needs of the firm and stakeholder. So if it's if responsible leadership takes that definition, then it's it's an individual construct. This is something about my orientation, uh, and it's, it's therefore quite personal um, to me. That's quite a quite a Kantian approach. It's about my intentions. The the ethics of whether whether this is ethical or not is is determined by my intentions rather than the outcomes. So it's a classic to the Kantian deontological um, approach, as opposed to um, is this the right thing to do being determined by the outcome? Does it turn out with more good than bad? It's a classic utilitarian kind of 
Jeremy Bentham type, uh, type approach uh, on the world. The challenge with that is, of course, that I might have the best of intentions, but if my boss, the vice chancellor, tells me I can't do that, then I'm in a quandary. Now I'm in this, this paradox of, of what do I do? And so I think one of the, the tensions with the responsible leadership is what level of leadership are you looking at when you're trying to judge uh, the behavior of an organization? Uh, and there's a lot of focus on the role of the CEO, this single person as being the controlling mind of the organization they set the tone and then determine whether others within that are allowed to give voice to their ethics and their values. On that. So that's the, the focus uh, very much on the, uh, 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 on the CEO. Um, we've done some research, Susanna mentioned that I um, shared the uh, Round the Tourism for Tomorrow Awards, the WTTC, for, I did that for five years and that was, uh, was fantastic. And one of my PhD students about 10 years ago did some interviews with the winners of the Tourism for Tomorrow Awards to try to um, understand their motivations and um, what had made them 10 years ago um, quite an outlier in pursuing sustainable businesses. So we proceed. Um, at that time, I would like to say it was because we were thinking ahead, but it was just because we ran out of time and got distracted on other things. But there were data that we didn't analyze. So like a good wine, we kind of laid it down. Uh, and um, now we've gone back and we've looked at them again and we've re-interviewed really people. So there's a paper coming out shortly um, uh, where we've done a sort of a longitudinal uh, analysis of what those people were thinking 10 years ago about these paradoxes of sustainable tourism. Uh, rather than, uh, and, and represent them with their views from then and then sort of challenge them to, uh, to rethink that uh, now. So responsible leadership is quite an individual orientation. Um, uh, corporate social responsibility is then a sort of a firm level um, kind, of, uh, kind of construct. Interestingly, the British Academy of Management have just changed their definition of management. And they now describe management as being uh, the pursuit of profit while achieving social goals. And that while achieving social goals, and it's led to quite a lot of squabbles, do, do you mean that the, the primary objective now of business is to pursue social goals and then to be making money while you're doing that? Or are these joint goals or where is it? But it feels like there's a shift there from the sort of the business as usual to let's try to do what we want to do, but do it in a less impactful kind of way. To actually our goal, our purpose, our orientation is to be more sustained, is to be sustainable, to pursue social goals. And then we try to profit from that as we go. And so I've sort of played around with the idea of corporate social relevance. Increasingly in the future, companies might have to demonstrate their relevance to society before they receive that sort of social license, license to operate kind of Rousseau uh, idea. So that's the sort of slight sort of theorizing I've done. To give you a, a, a more practical example. So Susanna says I chair a company called the Considerate Group. It's a consultancy. Um, what we do is we, we, we go into hotels, uh, only hotels and resorts, um, and we put monitors, we monitor absolutely everything, electricity, water waste uh, and energy. Um, and then we monitor that for a period of time and it allows them with the advice that we give to be very tailored to an organization and identify their energy uh, consumption. So let me give you an example. Uh, so this was a project we did for the Edwardian hotel groups uh, in London a few years ago. So these are the kind of um, outputs we get. Each one of those peaks is a day's worth of energy consumption. So high frequency data, every 30 minutes, we get a, a blip, one of those is, is every 30 minutes. So you can see the peaks and troughs that, that come in the day. Uh, so the, the troughs, this was after the invent, interventions, was essentially um, the security guard wandering around turning off lights um, throughout the hotel. Uh, and in particular was turning off the main chandelier in the reception between the hours, I think it was three and six or two and six or something like that, I can't remember what it was, um, on the basis that nobody's really in the chandelier in, uh, in the foyer. And if you're in the foyer at three o'clock in the morning, you're probably not looking at the chandelier uh, anyway. So we turn that off uh, and save energy. So this is the way we sort of classically present the results. And so you've got your electricity savings, 
convert that into carbon. But then, you know, the thing that gets the hook is converting that into room notes. Save. So if you save that amount of, of money, that's the equivalent of selling an extra 11 room nights at 150 pound uh, room rate. Um, and that's, you know, then what gets the, the hotel general manager to, to buy into this. We did the same for, we turned down the boiler by three degrees. Of course, nobody notices if your boiler's turned down three degrees. The toilet just means you mix less cold water in to cool off the water. It's still too hot as long as it doesn't um, lead to Legionnaire's disease or any waterborne infections, you're, you're fine. Um, so that produced another 29 room nights savings just by turning the boiler down for three nights, uh, for three degrees. And then the only sort of cost intervention was we put new shower heads in that use less water uh, and that saved uh, 70 room nights. So I get those as examples because when we present them back and when we sort of pitch for business, it's very much about the cost savings. Yeah, the responsible leadership literature would say we should be looking at people's intentions and their motivations uh, because if I, if I want to promote a sustainable business, that's the value that I bring into it and that's what drives my behaviour rather than the outcome which is saving money. Um, and so that's, I think, one of the challenges of responsible leadership, because I'm not sure how easy that is to understand people's intentions um, and then how useful that is, because in resource terms, we still achieve the same outcomes, whether we save them, uh, whether regardless of people's intentions or not. So somebody could be absolutely disinterested in sustainability and they're only interested in the room light savings, but we've still saved the, the energy water works. So that was my sort of thinking with regard to the, literature, the um, responsible leadership literature as to whether that's a very helpful way of thinking or not. Um, that's just one example. Um, this is a UK business values survey that the University of Oxford do. It's a survey of um, about 250 um, businesses, the biggest businesses in the UK, most of the sort of listed, but UK-based businesses. Uh, we've still got 250 left, uh, which was um, uh, good to know uh, from reading the survey. Um, Friendliness is not very really high. So, what's, well, so if you look through this, so the number one value, and this is post-COVID, so the number one value that was cited um, is collaboration. That surprised me that that would be the, the value. They, they, they give the example of um, the collaborations that came together through COVID of you know, big manufacturing firms that created ventilators and those kind of things are working with the NHS. Um, sustainability is 11th on the list, um, so that's the top 10, but so it's 11th on the list. Um, but you've got collaboration, you've got uh, respect, you've got empathy and responsibility there on the, the top 10 votes. But that's how uh, people see themselves. So, I think that's important to know yeah. whether they practice that. You're probably better off asking somebody else, somebody you think of this company, do they have these values or not? So these have come from a uh, effective uh, sort of a te text analysis of the corporate documentation. That's, yeah. that's how yeah, this has been arrived at. So this is the, the PR version of what yeah. they say about yeah. themselves. Um, so that, yes, you're right, that's an important caveat. But if you look at the bottom 10 values, we've got gratitude, um, hope, uh, humility, um, friendliness, authenticity, empowering. There seems to be more on the bottom 10 values that relate to sustainability than on the, the top 10 um, values. Um, hope, I think, is a really interesting one because if we're gonna be mindful of sustainability, we've got to have some hope for the future. And if that's one of the least cited values that there is, I guess you could argue at least it's been cited, but it's, mm. it's one of the least, uh, least important ones. Okay, positive examples um, of um, competitiveness. I'm going to sort of bring um, competitiveness back into the discussion. I guess just perhaps the orthodoxy view is that competitiveness is a good thing. Um, certainly Freeman's, Friedman's view is that this encourages us not to waste resources. We give it to the most efficient resources. In sport, clearly. Competitiveness is, is an important thing in lots of business, in lots of aspects of life. We see competitiveness as a, as a positive value. So let me give a few examples. So, yeah, Tourism for Tomorrow Awards. Um, this is one of the winners, a company called Soul Yachts. Um, 
they were trying to be the Tesla of the boating world, was how they described them themselves. Um, just small organization, uh, a guy, uh, a, a, a man and a woman, um, building boats in the Netherlands. Uh, the idea was that they're totally free of fossil fuels. And the nice thing about them is that when they're not being used, you plug them in and then they charge your, your grid uh, as well. So it becomes a, a floating solar array. In effect, um, they were very keen to be first to market. That was their real driving force. They, they were absolutely determined to be the first company on the market of solar phones, of a solar boat. Um, you're up against some really big players, though, when you're building boats. There's some big boat yards, and this is really capital intensive um, territory here. But they were so determined to do this and to be the first that they refused to partner. With anybody, and as a consequence, it just kept getting further and further and further away, and they never really sort of cracked the market. So they weren't eventually the first ones to put to put the boat out. I was just looking on their website uh, a couple of days ago, so they have now partnered with an organisation, and we were sort of banging them on the head to say, "You've got to. This is great, but you're not going to be able to do this alone." But their sort of own sense of competitiveness and determination was was preventing them from doing that. Um, this is a Soniva resort in the Maldives. Um, Sonu, who owns it, so it's Sonu and Eva. Um, it, they, they were the originators of the Six Senses um, resorts uh, as well. Absolutely driven to be the best in the world um, and really determined in the, um, to make this an amazing uh, resort. They uh, were the first ones to claim to be uh, net carbon zero, and they did that years and years ago. Uh, and that included flight, uh, and they really thought through everything. And so you won't be able to see it particularly, uh, but I managed to dig this out. This is 2014. They had this kind of scorecard of, but but if you look at what's on the scorecard, then you've got biodiversity, you've got um, transportation, you've got um, responsible purchasing, energy, water, waste. Um, and they were really harsh on themselves. I mean, it was an internal document. But Sonny, who's the owner of it, absolutely tore into his staff over this monthly sustainability report and uh, how they were performing. He's a really curious guy, but absolutely driven to be the, the best in the world. Uh, and then the last one is a company called Wilderness. They're my favourite company. And um, they operate in Southern Africa. Um, they've brought Black rhino, uh, which you can see in the picture, um, back from local extinction um, in Botswana and in Namibia. Um, they provided all their staff with free antiretrovirals if they had uh, HIV. Uh, schools, you know, and it's that part of the world where you've got to do a lot of this stuff. But essentially, this was a development company masquerading as a commercial company. They'd worked out that the best way that we could help this area is by charge $5,000 a night to come and stay in one of our resorts. Um, so it's super, super luxury, super upmarket. Um, but they do the most amazing work for the community. But they're driven to do this in a way that you see with elite level sports people and that degree of competition. They have the goal, and then this is about achieving the, uh, achieving the goal. So I give it as an example of competition because I think they see solving poverty and solving extinction as a competition and that they've got to win this um, before the rhinos go extinct. And then lastly, the, the Earthshot Prize, uh, which is Prince William's um, project, um, was, was meant to be similar to um, sort of the, the Manhattan Project, I guess, or the sort of X Prize or the, those kind of uh, moonshot awards, um, supposedly with a million pound um, prize for the, the organization that could make the biggest contribution towards sustainability. So it's, it, it's encouraging a very sort of competitive, single shot, single kind of single bullet approach to solving sustainability, rather than a more collaborative approach. What's interesting is that the winners seem to have adopted a much more collaborative approach. And there was a winner from, I was just looking at Indigenous women of the Great Barrier Reef were one of the winners, but it's about creating a network of rangers who are there to create and to protect the Barrier Reef. It's not at all Manhattan Project or X Prize or technological intervention. 
So, um, interesting, some positive examples of competition, negative examples. Um, so if we slightly, I don't mind, but for a second, if we have slight chat of house rules, because I'll open, then I can be in this group. Um, the Tourism for Tomorrow Awards were run by WTTC. They were stopped um, after five years. Uh, the reason they were stopped was because the wrong people kept winning uh, the awards. Uh, and um, the member organizations were paying $50,000 a year, the Marriott's, the Hilton's, the American Airlines were not winning and didn't like the fact that Wilderness and Soul Yachts and Soniva, who weren't members of a little sort of mum and pop kind of businesses, were getting to come up on stage and crash their party. And that didn't fit with their, their ethos of what the, the, the awards and the summit was meant to be. So their competition squashed the, uh, the awards. Can I ask a question here? Yeah, yeah. Because I always perceived that, so being at those summits and seeing the award ceremony, I almost thought those merits and Hilton's were quite happy for that to happen because it legitimized their tourism activity without them having, so it's almost like, okay, you build in a surprise, you make sure the sector looks sustainable and we go on other events. And um, I think that was a, Yes, I think there was that view, and I think that was certainly a view that they held in public. In, in private, I got lots of criticism every time somebody won that they didn't think should win. Um, and yet, WTTC were very good about allowing me to preserve my independence, but then ultimately they killed the award, so they weren't. <laughs> Shut them up. <laughs> um, I've um, we've just written, so our equivalent of your uh, ARC, UK Research and Innovation, UKRI. Um, I've just written the Sustainability Concordat, so the, a, a document that talks about research, sustainability in research, and, and how we will do that for the future. Um, we had a, a nice little section in there in, on sharing resources. So if you've got a big chemistry lab <coughs> that does something unique, and you're a university, that you might want to share that with your neighbouring university to see them having to build one and then have uh, you know minus 60 degree fridges running as well. Maybe you can share this. That got taken out. The vice chancellors were not having this idea that we would share uh, resources uh, at all with this. And so the competitiveness of ribbon cutting syndrome meant that we can't pursue sustainability as much as we would like to. And that I think gives rise to this sort of you know problem of sharing more broadly. I had lots of fights with academics about getting them to share offices uh, and. Um, <laughs> Lots of scars <laughs> again from that. But in, as a consequence, we have to build another 20 million pound building, um, which is resource intensive rather than sharing offices that we don't use. So I'm going to speed up a little bit. There's a nice study I came across called uh, Tim Bridget. Um, this is the effects of competitive personalities. So they were actually studying psychopathic personalities, and there's a wonderful validated test called the Dirty Dozen. There's 12 items that determine whether you're a psychopath or not. Um, but the, the behaviors of a psychopath are very similar to extremely competitive people. Uh, the two overlap uh, an awful lot. Um, and it's about distrust in others and you achieving your goals at the expense of other people. Um, so if you take the, so the, the study took the, the process of negotiation, so three kind of issues in negotiation. There's the classic one where a win for me is a loss for you. So we're negotiating over a price. I want to pay as little as possible. You want to pay, you want me to pay as much as possible. This is a nil-sum game. But there are what's called integrative problems where we disagree on a whole set of issues. The way that we maximize value is you give me one and I give you one and you give me one and I give you one and collectively we share the value of this negotiation. And then there are compatible problems where we don't disagree at all on issues, but we don't know we have those issues until we talk our way into it a little bit more. So this is not the reason why we've come together, but in discussing that issue, we discover, discover that there are other issues where we can do business and where we're, our interests uh, are aligned. So they set up this really nice study, got groups of people together, did personality tests, did awarded value, awarded prizes based on points, based on um, the value that they extracted from the negotiation. So competitive personality believes 
others are in opposition to them. So you come to the negotiation in sort of a combative form um, and that I've got to get my goals can only come at the expense of you. Um, so it, it destroys trust and it destroys social relations in the discussions. Now, what that means then is that the competitive personalities scored better on the distributed issues. They're better at those kind of negotiations because they're more aggressive uh, and they're more used to those conversations. <clears throat> but they scored lower on the other kinds of things because once you've had one of those fights with somebody about what price you're paying, you walk away from the negotiation. You're not about to carry on exploring what other issues we've got in common. Um, so overall, competitive personalities didn't score any higher than non-competitive personalities. It's because they left a lot of value on the table that was unexplored and, and undelivered. Whereas the more collaborative personality, they lost on the direct negotiation, but were able to, to, to achieve better on the, the other tasks. Just as a, as a non-academic solution, so um, the guy on the left, as you look at it, is uh, Joan Laporta, who's the president of Barcelona Football Club. Um, Lewandowski on the right, who they just bought for 50 million to become um, from Bayern Munich. Uh, so um, to become president of Barcelona, you have to be elected. So they make all these outrageous promises of what they're going to do during their tenure. So Laporta has come in. Uh, and his way of staying in power was to spend a preposterous amount of money. They didn't have a preposterous amount of money. So he's effectively bankrupted the club in order to spend a huge amount of money to, to artificially inflate the performance of the club to allow him to continue as president. So he's sold over, it's going to be about 70% of their future TV rights for the next 25 years for about 700 million. So he's in effect mortgaged the house for the next 25 years to give them this short term shot in the arm that allows them to buy Lewandowski and all of these players in order to try to win uh, and for him to become elected as president. And so there's a really extreme competitive personality. And then similarly yesterday, the Chelsea Football Club spent 500 million this month on players. And the Spanish League described it as being like doping. And I thought that's really interesting that it's almost like taking steroids um, and the artificial inflation of performance, but with huge long term risks for your health and all the athletes that, <coughs> that don't. So, is there something about sustainability, though, that makes it different from sport and makes it different from all the other kind of examples that I've, I've talked about, which is perhaps a question that uh, somebody was going to ask? Um, I think sustainability requires a stakeholder approach because sustainability is multidimensional. It's not measured with a single KPI of uh, being profitable. Um, so it, it takes a more complex um, set of actors to come to the stage. One of my PhD students did some research with airlines um, and airline leaders, um, and it was after 9-11 and how they reacted to 9-11 and how they reacted to sustainability. And what she found was that the, engine, the CEOs were largely engineering based. They were really good at solving the problem of terrorism because essentially they engineered out terrorism. So it was all of the, you know, the, the locks on, the, on the, the pilot's door, it's the security procedures, it's all the stages that you go through. There's an engineering technical solution to that. And these people were really good at that. The sustainability challenge, the airlines have been pretty hopeless and the CEOs are getting their head into this. It's a much more complex, messy kind of problem. And these are not people, largely men, uh, who are not able to deal with that kind of complexity. So I think sustainability, it, it takes longer to see the benefits um, and so a greater, more sort of concerted effort over time. So if you're a competitive personality, you need your kind of dopamine hit quite quickly. It's not going to come from pursuing a sustainability project. It's harder to measure, therefore it's harder to get credit for it. The link between your effort and an outcome is more difficult to determine. So, you know, competitive people like to play, like to get a credit for what they're doing. So that, that's difficult. So I think sustainability then becomes actually less attractive to pursue than more individually, more obviously commercial um, opportunities. So if you're a competitive person, Sustainability might not be the direction 
that you would go, you would pursue a uh, more obviously commercial policy approach. This whole bunch of stuff here, I'm not going to, um, uh, I'm happy for the slides to be sent out, so I'll, um, uh, I'll skip through these. But these are three examples that I've been doing some work with um, one of the trade associations, the Sustainable Hospitality Alliance, on how they can bring the industry together more um, and be more effective. So I've been looking at other uh, trade associations in other industries, and there's some really nice examples of this. So this is the Sustainable Apparel um, Coalition. It's essentially the big um, clothing, footwear manufacturers. It's Nike, it's Adidas, it's Gap, it's, it's those big companies. Revenues over $850 billion a year. They developed a really nice um, index called the Hibby Index, which um, forces you to assess your supply chain. If you're a member of the Sustainable Apparel Co Coalition, you have to use this tool. They insist on it as a condition of membership that you use this tool. And then they have a big meeting where they all sit around the table, Chatham House, they reveal the results, league table, who's at the top, who's at the bottom, um, and they discuss it in an open forum of why Nike are you at the top, why Adidas are you at the bottom. Uh, of it. So it's quite a nice kind of model of how you can use people's com competition, but in a collaborative um, kind of way. Similarly, the Consumer Goods Forum does the same for, um, um, uh, it's, so it's Marks and Spencers, it's Walmart, it's the only Australian member is Woolworths, um, but you know, it's your, pretty much your biggest company, that's I guess good that, that they're involved. Um, they do the same, they've identified um, eight issues, which are what they call pre-competitive issues, so they're issues where companies are happy to talk to each other, because they don't believe they can get a competitive advantage on the others by talking about those issues. What do they call them? They're pre competitive issues. Yeah. Um, so it's things like um, use of palm oil in their products. So that's not something they think if, we, if we've got less use of palm oil than your product, that consumers are really going to react to that. So let's just talk about how well I've managed to reduce my palm oil consumption and you haven't, and then we can all reduce our palm oil. So it's pre competitive issues. Um, um, uh, yeah, I'll skip through that. And then lastly is um, the fashion pact, uh, which is a similar kind of thing. So it's the, the high end fashion, it's the Gucci's, the Armani's, the uh, Ralph Lauren's. They've got three areas. Uh, it was launched by uh, Emmanuel, Emmanuel Macron um, at the G7 uh, in France a couple of years ago. It's got Paul Polman, um, who's former CEO of um, Unilever. So it's got some real star power. This was really launched sort of in a very um, South France kind of glitzy red camp red, um, uh, carpet kind of way. And you had all these companies wanting to engage with this and rub shoulders with, with the bright and the beautiful. Um, and again, it seems to be making some progress in, in getting those organizations to, to collaborate around certain issues. Some very competitive. Right, last couple of slides and then I'll start. And um, Smart Carney, who was the former governor of the Bank of England um, last year, uh, talking about how we change business. And Mark Carney before, uh, well, Mark Carney is a fairly sort of level-headed economist. Um, he says, this development is not easy, but it is possible and can be strengthened by designing incentive structures and organizational ecosystems. So for example, make it easier for people to ask questions rather than to avoid difficult decisions, express appreciation for the support of others, own their area, errors and limitations, and take account of the needs of others. So there's a lot in that that's very stakeholder approach to business. And that's coming and say from the former governor of the Bank of England. And there are organizations that do some of those things, clearly. Um, I was just, uh, so Four Seasons Hotel Group, their senior leaders, they get a bonus if their staff get promoted. And I thought that's a really nice way of making sure that you take an involvement in the mentoring and the development of your staff. Um, Boeing, the aircraft manufacturer, you get a bonus if you bring forward a mistake, because clearly 
having a mistake in aircraft manufacturing is a really bad idea. Uh, and so if you, uh, you don't want people covering this up, so if you come forward with a mistake, you get a bonus. Did you say Boeing is doing this? Boeing does not very successfully. No. So I'm sure Mark Carney probably wasn't on the sustainability uh, journal of sustainability, but if he had a couple of years ago, we'd have seen this this model, which I think sort of encapsulates what what Carney was talking about. Um, so points at the top. Sorry, um, points at the top. So the power of the CEO. And their sort of autocracy has a significant impact on sustainable behavior. So if you think Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, the autocrats within their own organizations, answerable to nobody, that tends to correlate very poorly with sustainable behavior uh, in the literature. Against that, they've got this, what they call the CEO effect at the bottom, um, which is <coughs> bigger boards tend to correlate with more sustainable behavior because you've got a more stakeholder view, it, it dilutes the extremist view, it dilutes the, the degree of competition and competitiveness um, on the board. But CEO personality, um, they identify narcissism and hubris as two, um, two personality traits that have a negative impact on sustainable behavior. So I guess what I'm trying to do is add there the idea that it's competitiveness as well as narcissism and, and hubris. Um, weighing against that is the CEO profile. So what we see is that females tend to uh, correlate more highly with sustainable behavior. Interestingly, if you've got an MBA, that correlates more positively with sustainable behavior. And that's interesting given some of the criticism that uh, MBAs got over the, the financial crash in 2008. Um, but it does perhaps reflect well on the role that we do as educators increasingly in making people aware of uh, the importance um, <clears throat> in sustainability. My thinking about that, though, is, is whether the students that we train in sustainability are making it to the top of organisations or if being mindful of sustainability actually hinders your chances of becoming of making it to the top of an organisation. So that's something I'm going to into last slide. So is it um, compatible with competitiveness? Um, I think without the right context around it to so some of those kind of infrastructure, um, uh, some of the infrastructure, then clearly a competitive personality can stop the level of collaboration necessary to be more sustainable. Um, so I would argue we probably need to introduce virtue ethics with the pursuit of a good life, what makes a good life. Um, for leaders and maybe encouraging some of those values of humility, respect, hope, gratitude that were amongst the lowest on that list and get those promoted to be higher. And then it made me think, I've never written a sustainability plan, and I've written lots of those, where we've talked about the values of the leaders as one of the interventions that we might look at, one of the levers we might look to pull. We look to pull technological levers, policy levers, legal levers, economic levers, pricing, all those things. But we never, I and mean, sometimes we talk about, you know, the G of ESG is about the, the sort of the governance architecture of an organization. But we never talk about the personality of the leaders. And if that is a factor in whether we pursue more sustainable objectives or not, then maybe that should be something more obviously in sustainability plan three. Really very personal to leaders, but might be that's something we can factor in. And then if we are, then perhaps we do need to start thinking about measuring and reporting on values, as you said, and um, in our annual reports. Again, if it's an important component of whether an organization is sustainable or not, then perhaps we should be trying to capture that uh, and report it. So it's a bit of a jumble of thoughts, um, but I really appreciate some thought and some help and some mm -hmm. ideas and questions um, from you. So thank you oh, very thank much. You. For your